news about this the good news about this second half is that whatever the outcome there'll be no extra time or penalties so that, that's uh, much to my relief um, but anyway before we hear from Karen of Archer um, and Kusla Davy we're going to hear from Anthony Thank you very much, probably now. What a great start to the second half there. Um, right, so what's coming up over the next few weeks? Um, I hear you ask. Um, Friday, uh, we have a drop-in meditation. Those start at 1 p.m. They're a really good way of just, when you feel like you've got a lunchtime free, just go and have a meditation. It's good. Um, the next uh, uh, um, item is um, Wednesday the 21st is Sangha night. Um, there isn't any body yoga this week. Uh, Kashantika is having a week off there. Um, now, so Sangha night next week is the first part of a two-part series, the first half of, of two halves. And it's called Recollections on Fire, this series is. Um, and it's, it's kind of based around uh, the Dharma Day. Uh, and this first title of the, of the talk is called, the first part is called The Furnace of Friendship. Saturday the 24th we have Dharma Day and this Dharma Day we're going to reflect on the roles that we each play in the turning of the wheel and what you're asked to do is to bring a favorite, favorite piece of Dharma or a Buddha or Bodhisattva who's current uh, source of inspiration for you uh, and you contribute to a meditative morning which will include storytelling, personal talks and puja. The second uh, part of those talks will be on Wednesday the 28th, um, and that one's called All is Burning. I kind of feel like I'm listening to part Inferno, Towering Inferno, part one and part two. That second one's All is Burning. And uh, so that kind of gives you a kind of a, uh, a resume of what's happening on, on uh, over the next few weeks um, for the Sangha. Thanks, Bonnie Naya. Passing back over to you. Thank you, Anthony receiving your passing over <laughs> okay so uh we're gonna continue our going for refuge uh, theme tonight um over the last well, several weeks now we've been having several talks from all the members about how they express that how they express their going for refuge and how that can be reflected in different lifestyles and tonight we're going to be hearing from karen of archer uh, now, Karen of Archer is, uh, I think, perhaps the longest serving order member that we have for our centre. Uh, um, or Nottingham Centre, is that uh, currently involved? No, came as Siri. Oh, oh no, I, I mean in relationship to the Nottingham Buddhist Centre. Oh, you mean born and bred? Sort of thing. Yes, that's, that's the best um, way of putting it. I think Punyaruchi, but she doesn't show up here very often. I okay. Punyaruchi. I have that. Okay. Know. Well, I'm st I'm still got the threads of my narrative still alive here. <laughs> anyway, but yeah, but I think that there's something here about keep that connection that we have with the roots of the Nottingham Buddhist Centre and uh, its early history. But uh, what I like about Karen of Archer is is her honesty. There's something very Vajra-like about it and the clarity that that she brings and. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm anticipating there'll be more of that tonight. So uh, thank you, Karen of Archer, for being here tonight. I know you're not 100%, uh, but thank you ever so much for, you know, sort of, um, you know, bringing your experience and your going for refuge, if you like, to, to tonight's session. Mm, thank you. Yeah, I've been trying to think what the uh, talks version of a penalty shootout would be, but I haven't got anywhere with it. Um, yeah, I'm really sorry. I was looking forward to actually being in the shrine room with everyone, but I have come down with something a bit, so I'm feeling a bit ropey, and I went and had a test today, so I've now got to self-isolate, at least till I get the result. I don't think I've got COVID, but you never know. Um, anyway, so in a way, it's quite lucky that I had my talk written yesterday, because honestly, if I had to do it sort of on my wits, as it were, today, you would get a very dull talk. But uh, I have written it down. So, uh, yeah, I've actually really enjoyed, I think I've heard most of the talks in this series, maybe not all of them. And I've really enjoyed hearing 
just how differently everyone comes at this topic. You know, and you get a flavour of, I mean, we've had quite a lot of life stories, really, which is to some extent what this is. Uh, and I always find it really reassuring to this kind of sense that order members come in so many sort of different shapes, sizes and flavours, as it were, you know, that, that, that it really isn't a kind of clony thing. And actually, when I first approached uh, Sri Ratna, as I sort of edged my way towards Buddhism, uh, that kind of reassurance was really important to me. Um, at that time, when I first got involved, I was, uh, I was just heading towards my mid 40s. Uh, and I was definitely quite kind of consciously on a spiritual quest. I, I knew that I, I needed teachings and some sort of community, uh, spiritual community. But I was also extremely wary. Um, I definitely didn't want to be, I was wary about, you know, I didn't want to be in some kind of a sort of spiritual bubble that turned away from the troubles of the world into some kind of transcendental bliss. Uh, and yet at the same time, um, I'd had real kind of uh, mm, a sense or intimations maybe of that kind of limitless, wide open, different kind of consciousness. And I definitely wanted a kind of more of a way into it. I'd had some little sort of tastes of that, I think. And I, I, I knew that I needed it and that I really wanted a kind of way into, um, into something that was sort of uh, beyond that subjective human mess uh, and beyond myself, my, my own sort of limited subjective conditioned self, you know, uh, that I wanted something to guide me and that I felt that I could lean into. So in a way, whatever thread I'd been following had brought me to a point then of a kind of recognition of the need for an explicit spiritual path. And sort of having heard, as I said, most of the other talks in this series, I, I was kind of very aware of the different threads that people had been somehow tracking and that had brought them into Tri Ratna, into the order. And I do think in a way it is like looking back and you kind of, you know, you do this thing as a human being, you kind of construct a kind of order or something that might look slightly like a coherent narrative out of what feels at the time, uh, you know, when you're living it fairly random and perhaps a bit chaotic. And uh, yeah, a bit of a disclaimer really as well. As Shantika, Shantika said, I think last week, that what you get is your version of yourself as it presents in this particular moment. So, you know, it could be a different version slightly. Uh, you bring different things out. So coming back to threads. So I was thinking about my thread. What's the thread that I think brought me here? Or a thread. And I think it really is my need, longing, wish to contribute, as it were, to, to the creation of a more compassionate world, uh, particularly a kind of vision of nonviolence and the unfolding of that, and kind of all the places in my life that that's taken me. And it feels like sometimes that thread has been vague, and at other times, you know, when I've sort of drifted around in different things, and at other times it's come much more in focus, but it has never gone away not really since I lit upon the mention of nonviolence in my mid-teens. I first kind of came across that kind of idea. So in my life, the root of this is pretty obvious. I was born in 1950 in London, very much in the wake of the Second World War, into a family of Holocaust refugees and also a community of Holocaust refugees. My parents were Austrian, Viennese Jews, they were virulent atheists, so not practicing as religious Jews, uh, and they were socialists. And really, this was kind of true of the whole community that they were sort of part of. So I grew up in quite a political and sort of culturally Jewish and culturally Central European environment. Uh, uh, in the sort of quiet... 1950s, my god it was quiet, buttoned down, post-war buttoned down London suburbs. 
which is where a very confused and scared little me went to school, which was like going to another world, moving between worlds. So I'm really aware there are these huge and tragic events that happen, wars and genocides, you know, human made things, traumas, tragedies, and also things like earthquakes. And inevitably, you know, we sometimes think about the experiences of the individuals involved, but the world always moves on. Uh, and I think, I guess we don't often think of the survivors, you know, once the sort of the main drama's over, as it were, of those people and families after these events are over and what happens to them in, in the wake of it, you know, sort of tucked away in their homes, maybe in new countries, just trying to get on with life in the wake of whatever's happened to them. So kind of that's where I come in. And I really don't remember a time of not knowing about the Holocaust in some sort of may way. And maybe there wasn't a time when I didn't know about it because there were, there were lots of things I was very frightened of when I was very small. Uh, and I guess gradually I came to know the actuality of it, you know, what happened to some members of my family. And it was kind of, it is and was kind of weaved into my experience of family. You know, we all have this sort of, yeah, that's just part of my experience of what family is like somehow, if you know what I mean. Uh, and it, 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 it remains a sort of bottom line a kind of backdrop for me in my life. And in a way, it's never very far away. There's some way that it sits in my being and in my consciousness. And um, that hasn't actually all been bad. I mean, you know, I had the good fortune not to have the experiences that uh, the generation before me had, uh, but it also meant that I kind of was left carrying a kind of awareness of human suffering of what humans and societies can do to each other, which I think in a way has been really important to me, actually, you know, to have had that and that kind of sense of that all my life. You know, and on some level, I still find, for example, the existence of war, militarism, arms trade, I find it incredibly shocking that that exists in the world, you know, that humans consciously engage, you know, in this thing that causes such unbelievable suffering. And yet, you know, we all in some ways take it for granted, you know, and it, it, it sometimes just comes at me sideways that we, that we really do that, you know, as societies, we do that. And all of that sort of has driven and drives my search for other ways for human beings to conduct themselves. You know, my very deep belief that we can do better than this. You know, really we can. So back to myself, like, like immigrants and refugees everywhere, I think my parents worked incredibly hard to create a secure home. And like a lot of immigrant children who are all around us, I think I, I, I felt that I had a sort of foot in two very different worlds or different communities and that I belonged to neither of them or anywhere really. So I had a kind of deep sense of dislocation and uh, that sense of outsiderness is very known to me. And interestingly, uh, I think it's that sense of outsiderness is probably known to very many of the people who find themselves coming through the doors of the Buddhist center. I mean, we could do a quick survey, I suppose, <laughs> as to how many people here felt in some way that they didn't quite fit or they were outsiders or whatever, whatever. Because actually I think it's something that really turns us into seekers. You know, the fact that there is something that just doesn't quite feel like we quite belong or there's something about us or our history or whatever. You know, Anyway, it became very crucial for me to try and make sense of things because the world was extremely confusing for me. And, uh, you know, of course, these kind of things are very hard to make sense of. So quite early on, you know, growing up in this kind of, yeah, there's a lot of talk about politics and history and all sorts of things. And, and, and quite early on, I had a realization 
uh, I remember having it. I remember where I was sitting on the stairs, you know, uh, and I just kind of had this real sense of, for example, how the horrors of the First World War led to the horrors of the Second World War, for example, the out of violence, essentially all that can come is more violence, you know, and that was a really strong realization to me. And as well, this kind of feeling there has to be another way, there has to be another way, you know, or as the Buddha put it, hatred does not cease by hatred, but only by love. This is the eternal rule, as the Buddha says in the Dhammapada. And, you know, this kind of seeking and thinking there's got to be another way it didn't only come from the Holocaust and history, but it also came actually from looking around at the adults in my life. And I think this is not an uncommon thing for children that you look at the adults, you look at your parents and their friends and you look at your teachers. And by the age of 10, certainly I had pretty much decided they were all nuts, really, to tell you the truth. So that was another kind of stimulus to think that had to be another way of doing things. Anyway, I was quite lucky to have my teens uh, coincided with the 1960s, which, as you probably know, was quite a, an explosion of all sorts. Uh, it was quite a, an extraordinary time to be a teenager, actually. Um, you know, there was everything was happening. There was suddenly not only this kind of explosion uh, of music and, and, and kind of colour, you know, it, England, London was this grey drab place and then suddenly it turned into the so-called swinging London uh, and it was quite an amazing sort of time uh, and there were also lots of amazing radical ideas and projects that kind of exploded into this very what had been this very buttoned down time so uh, I got passionately involved in sort of anti-nuclear uh, sort of peace movement things and anti Vietnam War protest, as well as, you know, all sorts of kind of crazy hippie wonderfulness, some of which was more crazy than wonderful and some more wonderful than crazy. Uh, but I was very keen. I, I didn't I didn't want to go into that sort of list out hippie, completely drug oriented or whatever, uh, because I had this thing about not wanting to turn away from what was happening in the world and, and sort of go into denial. So it was during that time that, for example, I first saw Buddhist monks on the, on the, on the big anti-Vietnam War protests that happened during the 60s. Uh, there, were, there, was, there was a largish group of Vietnamese in London of Vietnamese Buddhist monks, and they were very, very impressive. You know, there was all this kind of madness going on and shouting and da 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 da. And then you just, they just came this kind of body of grey robed monks, just very beautiful in their walking, very quiet. So they were very impactful. And of course, as well in the 60s, you know, people were coming back from India, the whole hippie trail. And a lot of, you know, there was a lot of fascination with India and, uh, you know, Buddhist rupas started appearing in gift shops and the like, you know, and in various places, uh, and, and, and definitely had quite a kind of strong impression. Um, and it was at that time, sort of in my mid-teens, that I first heard this, what was for me a bit of a magic word, which was non-violence, non-violence, one word. And it was a complete aha moment for me. Um, I just thought, oh, this is it. This is that other way of being. It does exist. There are people thinking about this. There are people who know about this or people who, who live this or, you know, it was like, it was like quite amazing for me. And it's never meant for me. I've never understood it as being just about not being violent. You know, for me, it's always been about what does it mean really to live with love and respect for everything and everyone? You know, what is that? What does it take? How do you do it? You know, those kind of questions. But there was no way at that point uh, in my teens, early twenties, that I was ready to turn towards spirituality because to me, spirituality represented a turning away from what was going on in the world, even a sort of conning people into putting up with, you know, oppressive and violent status quo. You know, I so saw religions as fairly hypocritical and you know, the whole opiate of the people's thing. And I just wasn't ready. 
anyway, to cut it a bit short, because, you know, my life's been quite long by now, so this could go on a long time, but I'm trying, with, I'm trying my best that it, it shouldn't. So to cut it a bit short, I did have many years of activism, mainly around the peace movement. I was also raising my wonderful son and playing lots of music. And at a certain point, I kind of ran out of steam with it all. Uh, it was in the wake of a big relationship breakup, and it was just like everything fell out of the cupboard. You know, all my childhood insecurities that I hadn't really looked at. And I had to face into the fact that despite my big thing about nonviolence, I actually carried a lot of hostility towards people who didn't think like me. Uh, in a way, I felt like I was at war with most of the world around me and also in many ways at war with myself. So I got involved in therapy. I did a lot of training as well as a lot of my own therapy and I became one of that vast band of wounded healers. An amazing vast band actually. Uh, and that was my work for about 30 years until quite recently when I retired. And I learned a huge amount really from my own therapy and the people that I worked with, a lot about trauma actually. And I think I started to transform some of that judgmentalism and resentment and pain inside myself, you know, and that will always be ongoing work in progress. It just is ongoing work in progress. You know, um, my take on it is that we do also all live in an essentially power over competitive, essentially violent society. And it shapes all of us to some extent, you know, we have our work to do for sure. So at a certain point, somewhere in the 90s, I realized that therapy could only take me so far. And, you know, that longing really got stronger. It kind of arose in me for a spiritual practice. And, you know, actually the therapies that I had trained in did have to some extent quite a spiritual dimension. You know, I'd learned to meditate and kind of open myself to something bigger in a vague kind of way. So I sort of felt, I had this image that it kind of took me to the gates of something, you know, but it, but it just took me to the gates. And I also kind of recognized at that time, really, that this tracking uh, of nonviolence had in a way always been, at least to some extent, a spiritual quest, you know, right from early on. You know, and years ago, as I said, I had sort of clocked Buddhism, uh, seeing those monks, those Vietnamese monks, and also associating Buddhism with nonviolence. I think at that time, I'd kind of earmarked it as something I would probably come back to. You know, I sort of clocked it in some way. So now I kind of felt like I wanted to head more towards the heart of nonviolence. And I also wanted to learn to meditate properly. I had a general longing for that kind of deepening at this point. So after a bit of exploring, I found my way to what was then called the FWBO, the Friends of the Western Buddhist Order. This would be about 1994, uh, you know, now known as Tri Ratna. And for me, it wasn't like a homecoming. You know, various people, I'm always dead jealous. <laughs> various people will talk about it and they said, oh, it was just like I was coming home and it was all, and it wasn't like that for me at all. I didn't find it easy. And sometimes even now as an order member, I don't find it easy. I remember very early on coming to the center on a day when Britain had just got involved in a war. I think it was the first Gulf War, I'm not sure. And I came to the center expecting everybody to be shocked and talking about it. And there was not a mention. And I thought, what am I doing here with these people? <laughs> but I didn't leave and I haven't, despite all sorts of things that have happened. All sorts of times when you might have thought, when I might have thought I would leave, but I didn't and I haven't. And it's because there's always been too much amazing stuff pulling me, too much truth pulling me, we might say, too much vision pulling me. Uh, and also too many excellent people, even if they weren't talking about the Gulf War. <laughs> so I've come over time to believe that true nonviolence can only arise fully out of the development of insight, which doesn't mean we can't go a long way towards it. But as it is said, the Dharma flies on two wings, wisdom and compassion. And true compassionate action uh, 
arises, I, I believe, more and more out of insight. So, in 2018, with the emergence of Extinction Rebellion and its principles of respect, love, and nonviolence, I joyfully and with some relief again became engaged in activism after about a 30 year break. And it was a great relief to me because I had felt very uncomfortable about not knowing where to put myself in relation to, you know, the climate and ecological emergency, but I had not felt fired up by anything. And um, it's been really important for me these past couple of years to re-engage really with activism you know, very specifically with an organization with a very strong kind of principled ethical sort of stance. And really it goes on being work in progress for me, learning to hold well, both a deepening spiritual practice and this kind of activity out in the world and how they can support and nourish each other. You know, because at this point it does feel really important to me as well as being involved in teaching the Dharma to be acting uh, in relation very specifically to the, the climate and ecological emergency. And I think it is in a way, it's a kind of challenge for each of us working out the relationship between our kind of normal daily life and the transcendental, the transcendent. You know, how our sense of the transcendent can come through to transform our daily life, our relationships and activities. And I suppose the commitment to that is really what I mean by going for refuge, that working on how, how the transcendental comes right down into every aspect of our lives and who we are and how we live, you know, and the commitment to ongoingly working through with that. I think Paraga said quite a few times about, you know, it goes on being work in progress. You know, this ordination is just, you know, a little way marker, really, it goes on being work in progress. So finally, I would say from my own experience, uh, expect it to be bumpy, at least some of the time, but don't let yourself get thrown off. That's it, folks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so as Bodhi and I mentioned, um, yeah, I'm just really going to tie up this series and what we've been looking at for the last few weeks with order members exploring going for refuge. I've really enjoyed it. And in a way, it's, um, it's for me, what most inspires me about the order is how going for refuge just doesn't have to look a certain way. And yeah, Karen, I've actually mentioned this too. It's not that we're trying to become clones of one another. It's that we're trying to express what's most, most important in our lives and live by that. So I'm just going to read a little extract from Sabuti. So um, there's a, a book booklet paper, perhaps, that was written in 1996 by Sangha Ratchita called Going for Refuge. And in the in introduction to that, Sabuti sort of introduces the relevance and importance of, of going for refuge and how Sangharachita has drawn that out for this particular movement. So um, yeah, I'll read it. <laughs> Sangharachita, after many years of study and practice, has come to see going for refuge to the three jewels as the central and definitive act of the Buddhist life in all its levels and stages. This re-emphasis is undoubtedly his most important contribution to modern Buddhism, since it restores the unity of the tradition without denying the spiritual value of the rich abundance of later Buddhist teachings. Sense can be made of the vast proliferation of practices and doctrines since each can be seen as being concerned with a different aspect of the act of going for refuge. Above all, this approach defines the Buddhist life in terms of an existential act, rather than a narrowly doctrinal formula or an act of conventional ceremony. Buddhism is concerned with a profound shift 
both inner and outer, away from the mundane world towards the Buddha. Going for refuge to the three jewels gives expression to that shift as it is made on deeper and deeper levels at every phase of the Buddhist life. So I just think that's just a really wonderful um, conclusion, introduction to going for refuge, if you like. So yeah, I'm just gonna read one sentence again. Buddhism is concerned with a profound shift, both inner and outer, away from the mundane world towards the Buddha. Yeah, so I just find that very beautiful. And I think because it is about that inner and outer shift within our own lives, that is why it can look very different between different people. So I'm going to give us a little recap of the last few weeks and what we've heard and from who and how that's been expressed in a number of different ways. So thinking back, I don't know when it was, but maybe four or five weeks ago, we heard from Arya Varchin. And Arya Varchin was particularly um, sharing with us the aspect of living in a community, the practice of community and friendship, that honest and intimate communication that he experienced when he was living in community. So he also spoke about that context as a place to develop, awaken to his own potential. And the encouragement, trust, love and care that he received from his friends. And also I know this because Aryavarchin mentions it quite often when we're together actually, how important lineage is to him. So Tri Ratna as a living tradition and the lineage of friendship really, Kalyana Mitra of that tradition being carried on since the time of the Buddha. And Aryavarchin very much sort of responds to that sense of being, of being a part of that lineage, I think. So then we heard from Jotida. Um, Jotida spoke to us about uh, having a family and living the household life. So he spoke a bit about his time before embracing Buddhism and the Dharma, and that um, what felt important to him in his life then was sort of pro pro progressing his career, being able to provide for his family. And he said there was some sense of simplicity in his life at one stage, but then things got much more complex once he tried to sort of get more and more in his life. So he wanted a bigger house, more money, his own business. And he said, I don't know if some of you were there and remember, he felt that there was this side of him that was becoming sort of disconnected. He, was, he said he felt he was starting to act in a way that he just didn't recognize. And uh, yeah, he was able to, um, sort of engage all of this side with with Buddhist practice with going for refuge and what was really moving was he spoke about this process of his relationship with Carolyn his wife and how they really had to sort of go deeper in their relationship as Joe today was expressing that his commitment to the three jewels didn't mean that he couldn't also be committed to his family and that actually what his practice was about was about engaging even more with his family and he, he gave us that lovely sort of quote around the householder life and that it was no longer crowded and dusty for him, but actually it was possible to live the household life and for that to be full of simplicity. Yeah, so that was very beautiful and inspiring as well. And we heard from Padma Saki. So Padma Saki spoke to us about that important step that she's taken in the last, well, a few weeks ago, to become an Anagarika or the step, the path of Brahmacharya. So deepening the third precept around stillness, simplicity and contentment. Um, and in a way, uh, I think she was telling us how the word Anagarika means homeless one and that the ideal of sort of um, in an inner way, actually letting go of our attachments and deepening one's contentment. And as part of that, Padmasaki shared with us that she will be going to the Spanish mountains to live and work in a retreat center there. But also Padmasaki expressed this beautiful wish to have less partiality and to develop love and care for more beings. And um, that sense of not doing that with just one particular person in her life, but wanting to have that 
that sort of sense of love and care for all beings. We heard from Artabandu. So Artabandu was exploring, um, well, he spoke mostly, didn't he, about what, what's happened since he's stepped away from the Buddhist center and uh, how, you know, he was so actively engaged for such a long time, which he said was very, um, a very important part of his practice living in a community, working in the Buddhist center, but that there was this inner calling in him for something else. Uh, and in a way that was the myth of the hermit or the kind of, if you like, even like the homeless wanderer or the forest dweller. So this myth of like this inner world and his imagination and engaging with creativity, wanting to have less responsibility for a time in his life. Yeah, so he spoke about how he's living in Jotada's, in a yurt in Jotada's back garden right now and fulfilling that myth of the hermit. <laughs> then we heard from Kemasiri who shared in a way her passion for the Sangha jewel. So Kemasiri spoke a lot about living and working with others and Sangha being at the heart of all of that. And just this very generous act that she did of going forth from London where she was in the midst of like what she described as the Buddhist village, which it still is now in that area, Bethnal Green around the London Buddhist Centre. When if you go there, you know, you walk around, you just meet so many Sri Ratna Buddhists in that area. <laughs> and she left that sort of very supportive context where, where there were lots of people practicing and a real sense of strong Sangha to take the Sangha elsewhere and to develop things in Amsterdam. And still there, what was at the heart of that for her was Sangha, developing teams, working with others, living with others. And then, yeah, we're very fortunate that she also came to Nottingham and continued to express that. Um, and yeah, I'm sure those of you, well, you'll all know Kemasiri and, you, and you'll know how important people and Sangha are to Kemasiri. That's really at the heart of her practice. Then we heard from Paraga. So Paraga shared a bit about, in a way, commit both commitment and lifestyle. So that phrase from Sangharachita about commitment being primary and lifestyle secondary. And in a way, Paraga was saying, if you sort of focus on one, the other will kind of fall into place. But really, he was speaking about commitment at heart. And yeah, he just very honestly shared how it's not a straightforward and easy path. And that's OK. <laughs> And in a way, the journey that we are all on is one of the power of the sort of transformation of going for refuge. And uh, yeah, it was very moving hearing Paraga talking about these sort of quite strong forces in his life. And because going for refuge and commitment was central, his life kind of just sort of centered around, around that. And um, yeah, but he spoke about the complexity of that as well. Then we heard from Satchamega. So Satchamega shared last week, I think, yeah, about her work as a chaplain in hospitals. And uh, yeah, what really moved me about Satchamega's talk was she was speaking about being fully present for people who were in need, whether that was people who were ill and dying and at the last stages of their life, or whether it's people who are rejoicing because they just had good news in hospital. She spoke about being there, witnessing and supporting people at that time. And also she shared that, you know, she was quite courageous. She sort of went forth and gave up certain aspects of her life, stepped out into the unknown for a while and knew that the path that she was on wasn't quite what she wanted to follow with her career. And it was a while before she found being a chaplain as, as the right sort of role. So there's something courageous there where she was following that sense of her going for refuge, but not really knowing where it would lead her. And then last week we heard from Kshantika too. So Kshantika was speaking about the importance of body-based practice. So she spoke about the Buddha's quest and how that spoke to her all her life. The Buddha's quest, the Buddha's intuition. And the Buddha knew that um, he had this intuition of knowing that things weren't weren't the way to liberation and yeah I could really sense that Shantika had this real question like oh how did the Buddha know how did the Buddha know what led to liberation or what didn't 
Yeah, and it was very moving. Shantika shared about her early life and how her, her early conditioning affected her. And then her response to this sense of a quest. And that ex expressed itself in her finding martial arts and body-based practice, but also stepping into an alternative life. And that's how she found the Dharma. Yeah, so quite a diversity. And then, of course, this evening, Karen Avacha speaking to us about compassion and nonviolence. And uh, yeah, that sense of there being, there must be another way. Yeah, I love what she said about the tracking of nonviolence as a spiritual quest. So, yeah, we all respond to different things. And hopefully the, the talks in the last few weeks have just shown that different things move us, different things spark our inspiration and our connection with the three jewels. So I'm going to read a quote from Sangharachita, which sort of touches on this a bit. We could say that standing behind every person is a sort of psychological come spiritual blueprint of which they are the expression and which they are trying to work out in the experiences and events and achievements of their life. If there is a blueprint, of course, one might think that someone must have drawn it up conceived it and one might even say that the conceiver or the preconceiver was you in your past life but one need not think of it in those terms if you study your own life you may see not just a repetition of a pattern or theme but the unfolding of a certain meaning it's difficult to see this early in one's life for obvious reasons but it's as though One's whole life in its different stages constitutes a working out of that meaning or pattern, that gestalt. That doesn't necessarily require some kind of external agency or an external plan within which one is a function. One need not take the word meaning too literally. Something can exist in a subtle form and receive expression in a grosser medium, or it can exist in a germinal form and receive expression in a fuller and more detailed and explicit manner. In a sense, everything is contained in the seed, but it is fully unfolded only in the whole plant and especially in the flower. The important point is that you are trying to work out an ideal in your spiritual life or as your spiritual life. It's not that you have a purely rational idea about enlightenment and you're trying to put that into practice on a purely rational basis. Much deeper, more creative forces have to be involved if you're going to get anywhere. Yeah, so Karen have actually touched on something similar, you know, looking back in our lives, we can often see these particular threads of meaning that we're following. I just wanted to share what inspires me about the Buddha, which partly is that he was able to see that different beings responded to different things. And he was not rigid or fixed in his teaching, but he was very creative, spontaneous, flexible and responsive so when he met different people in his life he was able to see what was important to them and what teaching would support them to grow in their own life and I think that's what I personally really value about the Dharma we don't have to be a certain personality to practice it and practice can look very different we're all going to respond to slightly different things different things will make us tick And yeah, that's what inspires me about the Buddha. He was really able to get himself out of the way and just respond to people in whatever way was most helpful for them. I find that very inspiring. And although tonight um, I was gonna give this talk to conclude the series, I thought, oh, well, that's interesting because this conclusion is also what inspires me most about finding, about going for refuge. So finding within myself what sparks my own inspiration and gets those creative forces on board 
and then supporting or creating the context that allow others to do that in their life. So I really find it wonderful and very inspiring to work out what really matters to someone, this sort of sense of like investigation of meeting someone and just finding out what is it that's really important in their lives and how, how is that going to unfold with their practice. So I'm going to end with a bit from the, because we'll go into groups after this, I think, but I'll end with a bit from the um, parable of the rain cloud. So this is where the Buddha adapts the Dharma according to his listeners, if you like. And this is from a version that was adapted and abridged by Ratna Prabha. So the Buddha's unbiased teaching is like the one rain. But beings, according to their capacities, receive it differently, just as the plants and trees each take a varying supply. The Buddha, by this image, skillfully reveals his methods, and with various expressions, he proclaims the one single Dharma, the one essential Dharma to be practiced according to ability, just as those thickets, forests, herbs and trees, true to their type, grow lush and beautiful. Just so, practicing it step by step, all can gain the fruit of the way. The Dharma taught by the Buddha is like this. It is just like a great cloud, which with the same kind of rain, enriches humans like blossoms so that each will bear fruit. The way in which you all walk is the Bodhisattva way. By gradually practicing and learning, you will all become Buddhas. So I hope this series has just demonstrated for you all that Dharma practice doesn't have to look a certain way in terms of lifestyle, personality, interest. What's most important is our commitment and contacting what makes us spark, because that's how we're really going to engage our emotions on the path and in our practice. And engaging all our energies and all our emotions is vital if we want to really change. So I think we often look at others and admire and think that we need to live our lives that same way. But often we're probably responding because that person is acting with integrity in a way that's true to them and applying the Dharma in their own situation. And I think that's what's inspiring and that is what we each need to do. So let's go into groups for the last little bit of time. Um, I've got a couple of questions, although I think there's plenty from the talks and yeah, I'm sure there's plenty that you can sort of reflect on. But I just thought you might want to share how does going for refuge express itself in your life? That's a big question, but you just might want to, you might have been sparked off by tonight or by some of the talks. And then the other question was, what is it that makes you spark? And can you see potential connections with that and your Dharma life? So that doesn't have to be anything around Buddhism. It, it can be anything in your life. What is it that really sparks you, that excites you, that inspires you? And can you see a connection or a thread between that and your Dharma life?